Can we look into this one? Perfect. Great. All right. Mm -hmm. So, and um, as far as the camera is concerned, uh, I guess it's great. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. So, Mike is good. Camera's good. Yeah. This is what they're seeing right now. So. Excellent. Yep. Okay. Okay. So, go for it. And Excellent. then I'll put the screen share back on. Okay. Thanks. Yep. All right. Uh, good evening. Welcome, everyone who's here in person and also out on the internet joining us remotely. Um, we have a really special uh, speaker tonight, and uh, yeah, would uh, would like to to welcome everyone from Capacity from CMAS, um, and uh, just a brief word about Cassie. Um, so I'm I'm a Cassie um, uh, Ottawa branch co-chair. My name is Omar Majid, and Cassie exists to exist the uh, to advance the art, science, engineering and applications related to aeronautics and space. And related technologies in Canada. So uh, that is our, our main mission. And uh, I guess I should say that this event is being held at Carleton University on unceded uh, Algonquin territory. Uh, it's, uh, it's important to note. Um, yeah, we, um, we are a big team uh, that organized this event. So uh, Jeff Bird, who's a uh, fellow Cassie co chair. Um, Professor Jeremy Laliberte, who's also been really key. Um, Jake Berkness, uh, the VP external of uh, CMAS. And then uh, in the background, uh, Todd Legault uh, from CASI headquarters and uh, April Duffy from CASI headquarters as well. So um, yeah, and we, we couldn't do this uh, without uh, you know, having our guest speaker, uh, Doug Morris, who so kindly uh, Agreed to come all the way from Toronto uh, to to talk about uh, low visibility landings and takeoffs. So just a, a, a few uh, words about him. He uh, he's a pilot uh, with uh, Air Canada um, with over twenty six thousand flight hours. Uh, currently on the Dreamliner, but previously on the A three twenty, and I think correct. he flew the A three thirty A three forty fire. Very yeah. good. So. Um, he, uh, as well as being a airline captain, he's also a certified meteorologist and uh, started his uh, career on the East Coast working for Environment Canada. Correct. Yeah. And um, he's also an author of now four books, of which <laughs> he has brought a number of copies here. So uh, there might be an opportunity to get an autograph copy um, this evening. So. Uh, yeah, without uh, further ado, uh, please join me uh, in welcoming uh, Captain Doug Morris for his for his talk. And uh, one other uh, bit of housekeeping, we'll monitor the chat and, um, uh, you know, any questions that you have, we'll answer at the end for those who are, who are on the chat. So, yeah, so um, welcome, uh, Captain Doug Morris. And um, uh, hi. thank you. Looks like we uh, pushed back about 10 minutes late. <laughs> okay, uh, so we're all set. Yeah, laser okay. pointers there, and the way I change with the arrows, all good. Good evening, or should I say, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's your captain, Doug Moore, speaking. Welcome aboard tonight. Well, yeah, we're going to talk about low visibility, and uh, and we're also going to talk about the Boeing seven eight seven, and uh, a little bit about jet engines. I was kind of reluctant. Uh, to talk about jet engines because I'm sort of preaching to the choir here. So uh, anyways, we'll take it as such. So my main presentation is going to be on low visibility flight. How do pilots land in low visibility? How do we take off in low visibility? And all the legality associated with this stuff. Um, and well, yes, as I mentioned, I'll talk about the Boeing 787 jet engines. I should mention, welcome to the most regimented, regulated industry I know. And it is the second safest mode of travel out there. Would anyone hazard a guess what the safest mode of travel is? Please don't tell me walking. That's very dangerous. Please don't tell me it's driving. Driving to the airport is the most dangerous thing about flying. Well, would anyone know what the safest mode of travel next to aviation is? <laughs> Rocket train. Sailing sounds good, but uh, 
would you believe it's the elevator? <laughs> the elevator is the safest mode of travel next to aviation. So anyways, without further ado, here we go. Uh, all pilots love talking about themselves. It sort of reminds me of that joke about how does a flight attendant with an airline pilot know her date is halfway done with the airline pilot? It's when the airline pilot says, enough about me, let's talk about you. What do you think about me? Okay. <laughs> and it was a joke. Uh, so anyways, yes, I am a Air Canada Boeing 787 captain with 26,000 flight hours. Just to give you uh, an equivalency to that, that is like driving daily for 10 hours for seven years. So if you're driving from Toronto to Montreal and back again daily for seven years, that's equivalent to 26,000 hours. So yeah, and I've had my license for 42 years. I am a certified meteorologist. I worked for Environment Canada for four years, but it's like the old aviation dream. Uh, aviation was falling off. So I had to go back to school, became a meteorologist and I worked for Environment Canada for four years. And I teach weather on the side. And also I am now a flight instructor for Air Canada. I'll be teaching other Boeing 787 pilots to land for the first time. Oh, my neck is gonna get a little sore. I did that about five years on the Airbus 320. And during COVID, I decided to get my master's from Purdue University. Uh, I wanna teach when I retire. And as you know, at least you need at least a, a master's degree to teach and I wanna head down to the States. However, if anyone's hiring here, I'm more, more than willing to listen. And as mentioned, I'm an author of four aviation books and I've been accused a few times of promoting my books. So here it goes. <laughs> this is my latest book. Uh, this is your captain speaking, it came out in April. Um, it's not very technical, it's light reading, but if you wanna know the two main questions that are always asked to pilots, the number one question is, why the bumps? A lot of people uh, want to know why the turbulence. And I know about 20 to 30% of you in this class have some sort of fear of flying. And after this presentation, I hope that percentage does not go up. Um, but it's, uh, that's why I explained the, the, why the bumps. The number two question, second question, that a lot of people ask me is, which is more dangerous, a takeoff or landing? And then I talk about that as well. And I'll also talk about... Um, well, the Mile High Club. Does anyone know what the Mile High Club is? That is not about air miles or airplane points. That's about promiscuity above a mile in the air. And that happens more than you think in airliners. In fact, there's websites where you can go on and brag about your promiscuity. But uh, there's a lot of good anecdotes in this book. And um, I sort of bypassed the fact that I was a freelance writer for Enroute Magazine. I've been writing for Enroute Magazine for 24 years. And because of it, I accrued a lot of uh, articles and uh, a lot of those articles are in my uh, book. So that is my latest book. And uh, I'll sell to you, $20 sign. But if there's any pilot wannabes in the room or anyone that a dis like dispatcher or um, anyone that's got a good interest in meteorology, I wrote this book, Canadian Aviation Weather. It's the number one weather book for pilots in Canada. So something to think about. I do have another weather book, but that's more geared towards um, pilots in the state. It's called Pilot Weather. And then I came up with a book from the flight deck in 2007. So that's my four weather book, or four books, and that's me. So this is your cabin speaking. There's my Boeing 787. Can I hopefully, can you see the, uh, the phenomena, the shadow of the airplane, and there's a ring around it? Would anyone know what that shadow and ring is called? and what it indicates to an airline pilot, to any pilot. That means there's a lot of liquid water content up there. So for a pilot, that means two things. As soon as he enters that cloud, there's gonna be icy conditions and turbulence. Pilots do not like to fly on tops of clouds because it's bumpy. Plus we don't like to fly on tops of clouds with high liquid water content because of the icy conditions. That phenomenon with the shadow inside that ring, it's sort of like a, a rainbow, but that phenomenon is called a pilot glory. There you go. So I am flying the Boeing 787. I've been on it for the last five years. I did 22 years of Airbus and then I switched to Boeing. If this class was 
filled with Boeing and Airbus pilots. There will be Airbus pilots over here and Boeing pilots here. You do not mix. Every pilot thinks their plane is the better of the two. I've experienced both. And at first, I didn't really like the Boeing, but it's growing on me. Very nice airplane. So it's a Boeing 787. It's made of composite instead of aluminum. So it's a lot lighter. The, and because of it, the construction of the airplane is a little bit different. So we can pressurize a little bit different. Most airliners out there, we pressurize at 8,000 feet. However, in the Dreamliner, we pressurize down to 6,000 feet. So when you're flying along, a lot of people think you're flying at sea level when you're in your airliner. You're not. You're actually sitting up at 8,000 feet. But in my airplane, you're sitting at 6,000 feet. So you feel a lot better, a lot more refreshed after a long flight. And because of it, because of the higher pressure, coffee is going to be a little bit warmer. Instead of uh, the coffee boiling at 94 degrees, uh, sorry, 96, is, yeah, at 94 degrees Celsius is going to maybe boil at 96 degrees uh, Celsius. Plus, we also add moisture to the air. Uh, typically, an airliner's air in the cabin is about 5 to 10 percent. We pump it up to 15 to 20 percent. It doesn't sound like much, but a little bit of moisture goes a long way as far as a long flight goes. We also have dust suppression for a smoother ride. Air is taken from the outside, not the engines. Most airliners bleed the engines, bleed the air from the engines. What we do is take the air right from the outside, and we use cabin air compressors, and that's how we uh, pressurize the cabin. It saves on fuel. And our engines are started electrically. That is huge. We no longer need nomadic air to start the jet engines. We start them electrically and we start them at the same time. So we can get away from the gate real quick. The brakes are electric. They're no longer hydraulic. So Boeing really thought outside the box as far as the uniqueness of the Boeing 787. And plus the 787 goes fast. We cruise at about Mach 8.6. That's 86% of the speed of sound. If you take an Airbus 320 to Vancouver tonight, you would probably be cruising at 7.8, Mach 7.8. It doesn't sound like much of a difference, but 0 0.01 Mach is about five knots. So we're going at least 40 to 50 more knots faster than most airplanes. Plus it gets up at altitude real quick. And that's what I love the, about the uniqueness of the, uh, the 787. And we also have dimmable windows. We don't have window shades on our windows. You press a button and it uh, electrifies a gel between those two window panes and it turns it black. So the flight attendants can instantly, instantaneously turn the cabin uh, lighting down to, to night mode. Okay. And it's also the biggest airliner window out there. So because of the composite, they can make a bigger window. So that's some of the uniqueness of the Boeing 787. Now, this is Captain Doug. I did a rare walk around in LA one night and I just threw my hat down here like this and took a picture of the jet engine. So this is the, uh, we have two different series of uh, Boeing 787s at Air Canada. We have the uh, Dash 9 and the Dash 8. This is the Dash 9 to walk around. So it has Gen X, one Bravo 74 to 75. It's got about a thrust of 74,100 pounds. Sorry, I don't have that in Newtons. In North America, we do not talk Newtons, not for airline pounds. We talk pounds of thrust. Uh, for the Boeing 787-8, it's the one Bravo 67s, and we thrust at 67,000 pounds. And uh, as a note, we do not own a jet engine in Air Canada. We lease all our jet engines. We also lease our brakes and we lease our tires. Anything that's got wear and tear, we lease them. It's better that way. Just uh, for FYI, a set of brakes for an Airbus 320 is $55,000. Brake pads on one wheel. Uh, this jet engine, it's, again, it's a Gen X 1 Bravo 74. It's got a 111 inch uh, span to it. 18 blades, those silver um, edges are titanium. And the price tag of a jet engine is about 20 to $25 million. The price tag for the, uh, for the 787 is about 200 million and we have almost 40 of them. So that's $8 billion of Boeing 787s Air Canada has. Plus of the, all the other couple of hundred airplanes we have. So there's money out there. Um, the first officer starts the engines. Years ago, it was the captain that started the engines, but now it's the first officer that starts the engines. But the captain taxis the airplane and parks the aircraft as well. 
We don't trust the first officers to park the airplane. We trust them to land, but we don't trust them to park the airplane. Uh, reverse thrust. I don't know if you ever noticed that when you're landing, you notice that the, there's no big loud rumbling anymore. Here at Air Canada, we try not to set max reverse when we land, only if we need to. We tend to use more brakes than the reverse thrust. However, again, for safety, we will go into the reverse thrust mode if need be. So the next time you'll notice, uh, notice if the captain or the pilot used reverse thrust on landing. And many airports request idle reverse thrust after landing. They want you to go only to use idle reverse. They don't want you using max reverse because of noise, noise abatement. So that's the, the Gen X beautiful engines for the Boeing 787. As well, a lot of people don't realize that we rarely take off with full power. Everyone assumes that when we take off, on the down run, the runway, uh, we use full power. Not so. We reduce the power, what's called a G-rate thrust. So Airbus denotes it as a flex temperature and Boeing uh, denotes it as assumed temperature. What does that mean? Basically, we tell the jet engine it's 55 degrees Celsius outside, so behave like it's 55 degrees Celsius out there. Give me the thrust of a 55 degrees Celsius ambient air conditions. So that's what we do. We, uh, we uh, reduce or derate the takeoffs. In fact, I've done takeoffs in the 787 where we took off with only 78% of power. We didn't need full 100% power. It saves wear and tear in the engines, fuel, noise, and whatnot. And this is the uh, Boeing 787 taking off from runway 33 left, uh, 33 right, sorry, in Toronto Pearson. And notice the big bow in the runway. Everyone thinks the runways are totally flat. Sometimes they got humps, and this one's got a major hump in it, 33 right in Pearson. By the way, did you hear about the price tag for the new runway at Pearson? They just redid it for $80 million. I can't wait to land on that one. So uh, it was requested that I mention about how engines are operated, manually and auto throttle. So, Again, as mentioned, the first officer starts up the engines. We start the engines simultaneously. And then we get taxi clearance. And then it's the captain that uh, taxis. And the captain can only throttle up to 35% of the engine setting. That's the max we're allowed. Other than that, we could be blowing out windows at the airport and stuff like that, or causing damage behind us. So 35% max is all I'm allowed to use to get going. Uh, I steer the airplane with a tiller on the side. And once we uh, take off, the takeoff procedure is for the pilot flying, they bring the thrust levers up to about 40% manually, and they click a toga switch. Toga stands for take off and go around. So we click that switch, and the thrust levers are brought up automatically to that uh, fixed setting we figured out during our pre flight. And then we're barreling down the runway and at 80 knots, we go into a hold mode. Basically, basically the pilot is now has the thrust levers just in case there's an engine failure. So he has full control of the thrust levers. Once we get airborne, the auto thrust kicks in again and away we go. So that's sort of the procedure barreling down the runway. Our climb, it's all done automatically. So we're always in uh, the auto throttle mode. The auto throttles are always on in an airliner. It's like the cruise controller of a, of a car. You tell it to go 60 miles an hour, it'll go 60 miles an hour. If I tell the airplane to go Mach 86, it'll do Mach 86. If I tell it to go down to 2000 feet per minute, it'll go down 2000 feet per minute. It's all done uh, based on the FMS, the flight management system and whatnot. And on the approach, same story and landing about 30 feet above the deck, uh, the engines will go back to idle and then we bring them back to idle, and then we taxi back in. And the auto throttle is just equivalent to a cruise control on the car. And this is the auto throttle, or this is the thrust, these are the thrust levers, and that button up there is the disconnect. That's how we disconnect the auto thrust, right there, that little button on the side. These devices here are my reverse. I bring them up, and then the, the airplane will go into reverse mode.
So that's the 787. That's some of the uniqueness of the 787. But I'm here to talk about low visibility. And do you see the Boeing 757 that just landed in St. John's, Newfoundland? I was told to hold short of that runway. I'm glad I did, or else it would have been a, an episode. This is YYT. That is the identifier for the most foggiest airport on the planet, St. John's, Newfoundland. When I teach weather, I always ask the pilots, do you have a Torbay story? Torbay is St. John's, Newfoundland. They all snicker because they think I'm referencing uh, George Street. It's got the most bars per capita in Canada. What I meant about the weather in St. John's, Newfoundland. If you want to see the foggiest, cloudiest, rainiest, windiest city in Canada, it's St. John's, Newfoundland. In fact, St. John just sits a little bit distance from the foggiest place on the planet. It's the Grand Banks. 120 days of the year, St. John's, Newfoundland sees fog. One third of the year, you're going to see visibility going down to a half mile or less. So this is St. John's. Uh, it's a 757. It's a cargo jet just landed. And this is my intro to low visibility. So before we go flying or any sort of flight, there are four different types of approaches. Actually, if you go Google this, they'll only say there's three types of approaches. But I said there's four. The, there's precision approaches. And I'm going to talk about one type of precision approach tonight, the ILS, the instrument landing system. The new kid on the block is called the GLS, GVAS uh, landing system. And I'll just mention about that a little bit. But GLS is just coming online. Very few airports are offering it. Then there's an approach with vertical guidance, GNS. That's the Global Navigation Satellite System. And there's about a, 10 different variations of uh, GPS approaches. I came in today with uh, Jazz. We landed on runway 25 in Ottawa, and I'm certain they probably did a GPS assisted uh, approach. However, the big airlines, we rarely use GPS approaches. And then there's non-precision approaches. There's old technology that still exists. So if I flew you down to Cozumel, Mexico tonight, I would have to do the old procedure called a VOR, very high frequency omnidirectional range approach in the Cosmel. So they, they paved the rate, runway, they've got a beautiful new terminal, but their approaches are pretty basic. And then there's the visual approach. Everyone thinks, oh man, every pilot wants a visual approach. Well, I'm gonna show you a few pictures that visual approaches do not work out so well. We always wanna be on instruments. Uh, these are the red lights. We never cross red lights. And we always read back our hold short uh, assignments as well, just because you never know what's out there. So here's the basics of an instrument landing system. It's, again, the most popular with airlines. What we have is two antennas that project a localizer and a glide slope. For the localizer, it's a spray of about 35 degrees. And that localizer antenna is located at the end of the runway. Then there's the glide slope uh, antenna, which is located about 1,000 feet at the beginning of the runway. And the glide slope tends to be three degrees, three degrees uh, angle for an airline pilot. So whenever you see a, an airplane coming in on the approach to an, any airport, if you're in LA, you see about 10 air, uh, Airliners lined up in the sky, they're all on a three degree glide slope. It looks like 30 degrees, but actually only three degrees. So we come in at three degrees all the time. So that is the basic instrument landing system. We have a glide slope and a localizer. So if the, in the airplane, the instruments, if the glide slope goes above, we have to go up and capture it. If the localizer go to the right, we gotta go get catch it. What we want is bullseye. And that means we're right on profile. We're right on laterally and we're vertically right on profile. And that will bring me right down to a certain uh, height above the runway. So that's the instrument landing system. Now there's a lot of components to the instrument landing system. And I know it's a busy slide, but we have the glide slope as mentioned, the localizer. There's high intensity runway lighting. There's sometimes center line lighting here in Ottawa. There is no centerline lighting because you do not have big sophisticated approaches here at Ottawa. 
Uh, there's RVR, runway visual range sensors. We need that, those. We have DME, distance <laughs> measuring equipment. Uh, as you can see, there's a lot of acronyms in aviation and I'm just touching on the surface. Then there's distant markers. These are the middle markers and the outer markers, but they're getting rid of those markers because of uh, GPS overlays and stuff like that. And then there's the PAPI, a precision, precision approach plan indicator or a VASIS, visual approach slope indicator system. But with all this, there's interference with ground equipment. So if I'm coming in on a low approach, all the ground equipment has to be away from the airport, even airplanes. It's expensive. A lot of airports don't have it. In fact, here in Ottawa, you still have two runways that do not have ILS approaches. And there's a lot of maintenance and calibration. I don't know if you've ever seen it. Nav Canada comes in and flies an RJ Challenger at low approaches onto the airports and they're calibrating the, uh, the, uh, the glide slope of the instrument landing system. So those are the instrument ILS components of a, uh, ILS components. I just wanted to show you um, some pictures I took. And this is the picture I took of 2-4 left at Pearson. Every year before COVID, they would shut down 2-4 left for a runway run. So you can go on the runway and run down and do a 5K run. And there's 3,000 people on that runway. And they're operating runway 24 right, right beside it. I am amazed no one's run across the runway to 24 right and shut down the operation, but they haven't. But anyways, it's something to think about. It's really neat to run down the runway. If a pilot is running down the runway, he's probably not having a good day, except when he does the, uh, the 5K run there. So I got the, uh, a chance to take this picture to show you the glide slope antenna the glide slope shack, we call it the glide slope shack, and there is the RVR sensor. And at the end of the runways is this localizer antenna. It looks like it's going lengthways of the runway, but it's actually cutting right across the, uh, the runway at the end of the runway. So that's a localizer. So the glide slope. Captain Guy, um, our system man is requesting that you stay within a one meter. Oh, okay, that's what I thought. Sorry. <laughs> the audience been shifting a bit, so. Okay. I tend to jump around too much, sorry. Good. This is the forward scattered RVR sensor. It measures visibility and feet. A lot of guys are liking it to a coat rack. It's a very expensive coat rack. Each of these sensors, there's 13 sensors at Pearson and each one costs $100,000. So how this works is there's two heads that are transmitting and two heads that are receiving. And if there's an obscuring phenomenon in between, like such as fog or blowing snow, it can measure that within feet. So that's how we know how many feet down the runway uh, these sensors are seeing. And that's what we can see or assume to see if, when we're landing or taking off. So you need these forward scattered RVR sensors. The old system was there was two lights transmitting on pedestals, but they were subjected to frost heaving and whatnot. These have been replaced about 15 years ago, and this is what we use to measure uh, visibility. In the States, their sensors only have two heads, but in Canada, we have four heads. Uh, just to show you some of the lighting, it can be a, quite a Christmas-like setting there with the approach lighting. The approach lighting ranges from strength one to super bright five. I've Talk to students and I asked the, uh, uh, the controller said, hey, can you turn up the lights for us to show the student how bright it is? And it just blinds you. It is very bright. And in fact, uh, the power bill goes up astronomically with the, when it's up to bright five. We use that when we get down to very, very low visibilities. And off to the left is a pappy light. Now these pappies operate on angle. Uh, it's not very convincing with this picture, but the two inner red lights are red and the two other lights are white. So red and over white is good. You means you're on course, you're on profile. If you see all white, you're too high. If you see all red, it's called you're dead, you're too low. So that's the sort of terminology we use with these lights. So I just wanted to show you where the PAPI exists and where the lighting exists for a typical instrument landing system uh, runway. Here's a better picture. Look at those PAPIs there. You can see the, uh, 
the red and the white there. Again, if they're all white, you're too high, all red, you're too low. And there's the approach. Uh, that's the beginning of the runway. All runway lights are separated 100 feet. So I'm sorry, 200 feet. And these are all the approach lights on uh, a high category ILS. So with an ILS, we break the ILS down into three categories. The standard ILS is a category one. I can get down to 200 feet above the ground using the barometric altimeter. You know, that's the little dials we have to adjust with the local atmospheric pressure. And that is a little bit dubious sometimes because 0.1 inch of change of mercury is about 100 feet. So you always want to be setting the local latest altimeter setting when we descend down to minimums on the category one, which gets me down to 200 feet above the ground. That is a standard category one, and most airports around the planet have ILSs category one. Now for category two, we forget about the barometric altimeter and we use the radial altimeter. So the radio altimeter is sending a beam down to the ground, calculating our height within feet. And so a category two approach is a hundred feet based on the radio altimeter. So I tell the airplane, I wanna get down to a hundred feet. And then the captain, because it's low visibility, the captain flies these approaches and the captain will make a decision whether to land or to go around. So that's a category two. Then, if the airport is qualified and the pilots are qualified and the airline is qualified, then we can go down to a category three. That is zero feet and that is auto land. And that's basically you push the button and wait for the bump <laughs> in zero visibility. That is confidence in your instruments. Any pilot that learns advanced flying always trusts your instruments. And this is a classic example. In fact, the briefing for the first officer, they have to remain heads down the entire time. If they put their head up during training, they failed their flight test. We want their heads down all the time looking at the instruments. The captain can look around, but I've got nothing to look at. It's pretty foggy out there. So those are the three categories of the ILS, category one, category two, and category three. Now, lately, uh, as you heard, uh, we're upgrading to 5G. And 5G is near the frequency of the radial altimeters. This is not good. Because if we have interference with the radial altimeters, well, a lot of nasty stuff can happen. And I don't want to mention this, but uh, yeah, a lot of nasty stuff can happen. So what we have now is no TAMs. Certain airports will say, hey, uh, we're not certified for uh, 5G issues. So you might not want to come and land here. However, in Air Canada, we all the airports we go to now are 5G uh, acceptable. So that's the things we're looking at. Basically, it's what's happened is um, the repeater stations are too close to the airports. So they're looking at ways to downgrade the power or just move the repeater stations. So that's what we're looking at as far as 5G issues with the radial temperatures. Again, I, I've flown many a times to LA and many other airports in the States and it hasn't been an issue. You can feel, feel free to ask questions along the way if you want. Yeah, okay, sure. Category three, you landed on your runway. How did you get out of the runway? Great question. And that, and that, you know what, you have a higher chance of getting lost on the ground than in the air. Uh, yeah, we have uh, low visibility approach charts. Uh, the lighting is such that we will follow the uh, the uh, runway center line lighting. And uh, yeah, it, it's a workout. It can be very, very difficult. And on that note, with a category two and category three, the localizer is so accurate, we have to remember to disengage it or else it'll bring the airplane back to the center of the runway when we're trying to taxi off. When I taught the Airbus, there was a, a captain, left seat candidate. He landed in a category two approach and he tried to taxi off using the tiller. He said, Doug, uh, this tiller's doing some weird things. And I said, just a minute, I'll, I'll try it. And as soon as I grabbed hold of the tiller, I realized we forgot to disengage the autopilot. It wanted to bring the airplane right back to the center line. By the way, we can do a Cat 3 Autoland on a Cat 1 approach, but it's got to be good visibility. 
just in case. <laughs> now, who has CAT2 and CAT3 capability here in Canada? So CAT3, the auto land, St. John's, the foggiest place on the planet, just got it about five years ago. Before, they didn't have Autoland, but they have it now. Toronto's got it, Calgary has it, and Vancouver. So only four airports has Category 3 Autoland certification. No, Ottawa does not. You don't miss the YMS? Mirabel does not have, uh, not to my knowledge, we don't fly into Mirabel, but uh, to my knowledge, I don't think we have, there's Cat 3 there. Yeah, there's Cat 2 in, in Dorbel. And I'll mention that, but uh, I think Maribel, no. Now, for CAT 2 airports, there's St. John's, of course. Halifax has it. Halifax needs it because it's probably the second foggiest place on the planet. I grew up in Halifax. Uh, there's Montreal. Montreal has a Category 2 approach. And Toronto, Calgary, and Vancouver. So you can see there's not many airports that even have CAT 2 approaches. Ottawa does not have CAT 2. A uh, CAT 2 and 3 approaches, as I mentioned, it's uh, the airport, it's got to be certified for it, actually particularly the runway, the crew, and the airline must be certified. It's always got to be captain flown. And also, this is kind of a neat fact, the backup power is used first, then the main power to supply for all ILS components. What do I mean by that is instead of running the main power here, at the university, we go into a generator mode. They start up the generator. That's what runs the CAT2 and CAT3 approaches. So if the generator shuts down, then we go back into the main power. That's how it's done for CAT2, CAT3. So the controller at the tower, he will flick the switch. So we have to go into CAT2 and CAT3 modes. We just can't go shooting an approach, say, I want to do a CAT2 or CAT3. There's a big procedure to do it. All right. Now, how do I get certified? for CAT 2s and CAT 3s? Well, it's all done in the simulator. We have to train in the virtual world for the real world. We just can't take an airplane, go flying and find a foggy airport. It's not gonna work, especially when we gotta get checked out every six months, six to eight months. So this is what we use is the simulator. Uh, here at Air Canada, we have about 14 simulators. And look at the price tag of a simulator, $20 million. And the simulator costs about $1,000 an hour to operate. It's big money. So the sim or the box we call replicates over 500 scenarios. It simulates sight, sight, sound, motion, and touch. In fact, this is how pilots get their full endorsement of the airplane from the simulator. The first time they see the real airplane is with a full load of passengers. I think that's kind of neat. However, they will fly with a supervisor, like my, or not, or, you know, a training pilot first, but then they will be released. But just to get your full endorsement from a simulator, that's how advanced these simulators are. Low visibility takeoffs and landings and rejects. Whenever I'm in the simulator and the instructor in the back brings down the visibility in the simulator, I know I'm going to get a reject or I'm going to get an engine failure. At rotation, it's called a V1 cut or something like that. I just know something catastrophic is going to happen when the visibility comes down. You just know. And then again, we practice engine failures and fires and low visibility. So that's the flight simulator world. Price tag, $20 million. We also, because uh, every airline is booming right now, our simulators are going 24-7 and we have to go elsewhere. So some guys are going to Honolulu, Miami, Gatwick, Doha, all around the world because we just don't have enough simulators to, to keep up with the, uh, the demand. And again, if anyone wants to be a pilot, the time is now. Air Canada alone, we need 800 more pilots. Okay, so the new kid on the block, is, as I mentioned, is called a GLS. A GBAS landing system. GBAS stands for ground-based augmentation system. So all, you only need one ground-based antenna, unlike the ILS, which is really good. So you could have the GPS system, then you've got an antenna on the ground, 
And that antenna can look after all the runways at the airport. And if there's another airport around within 30 miles, it will look after that airport. So it's fantastic. It's gonna be a, the new kid on the block. But as of now, we can't do Autolens on the GPS or the uh, GLS as of yet. It is so new that only, only a few airports in the world are using it, like Zurich, Frankfurt, Newark, Charleston, and Dallas. There are no GLS approaches here in Canada. I've shot a few approaches into Frankfurt using the GLS. In fact, uh, Frankfurt was giving money incentives. Hey, will you try out our GLS? We'll give you a, a little rebate on your landing fees. So that's what we're sort of enticed to do. And uh, yeah, Frankfurt has it, Zurich has it, but none in Canada yet. But this is going to be the new system. It's going to capitalize in the uh, global navigation satellite system, but you're going to have transmitters on the ground and uh, it'll bring us right down to ILS minimums. Again, we can't do auto lens as of yet. Now, years ago, they tried to replace the ILS with MLS, microwave landing system. That did not work. GPS and the uh, WAAS, the wide area augmentation system was a lot cheaper. So that's what's taking over more airports. Here in Ottawa, uh, you only had two ILSs, but you have GPS approaches on the other runways. Did the microwave landing system at least help with keeping the coffee hot? <laughs> cup, cup. I don't know about the coffee. Yeah, they have microwave. Yeah, uh, in fact, it, it, the MLS was, a lot of the research was done in Nova Scotia. Yeah. And I thought for sure it was it was the system, the system that was going to replace the ILS, but it didn't it didn't work that way. So again, um, and and when I say the ILS is the number one approach, that's for the older guys. That's for us. I'm going to do again. I probably I mentioned this before. I'm going to do 14 approaches in, into airports this month alone, and every single approach is going to be an ILS. I guarantee it. I'm going to Barbados on Saturday. ILS. I'm going to London Heathrow on Monday. ILS. Now I can't go in Heathrow, London Heathrow and say, oh, I would like to do the, uh, the the GPS approach on runway 27 left. They'll say, Air Canada, go in the hole for about an hour. I'll get back to you. You listen to them. They'll tell you what to do. So that's how we do it. And around the world, it's ILS, ILS, ILS. However, smaller airports here in Canada, uh, it's more leaning towards the GPS approaches. Okay, this is the flight, flight 624. I had to get a picture so you couldn't see the indent of the airline, but you'll probably guess who, uh, air, what airline that was. In 2015, this airline, this Airbus 320, shot the approach on runway 05 into Halifax. In Halifax, it's just like Ottawa. There are two ILSs on two runways, but the other two runways do not have any ILS. So what they had to do was do a localizer only. What you can do is you can borrow the localizer off the ILS on the other end of the runway. So they had came down laterally, no problem. But when they crossed the final approach fix, they had to descend. The descent rate was about three degrees on a good night. However, they temperature corrected. And when they temperature corrected, things didn't work out too well for them. And they hit the approach to this runway. And at first, it was deemed a hard landing. Uh, there's the engine there. But there's a joke in aviation. Pilots say, any landing you can walk away from is a good landing. It's a poor joke. But what happened here? They were on the approach. They didn't have an ILS, they were in a snowstorm, they went down to minimum, minimums, and they didn't have a GPS on board. So that's what happens when you don't have an ILS or a GPS equipped airplane. It's funny, to equip a GPS airplane of this size costs about a million dollars. I can go out to Canadian Tire and buy a GPS for $250. But to put it in an airliner, it's about a million dollars. Now all airliners come with GPSs, but there was a transition about 10, 15 years ago where a lot of airliners didn't have the GPS technology. So this is Halifax, Nova Scotia. I, I sold on this runway 42 years ago. In fact, 
it was called runway 0624. Now it's called runway 0523. Magnetic North has shifted, shifted in 42 years. So that's what happened there. No ILS, no GPS, but there were no casualties. Now you think, oh, what about a visual approach? Well, this is Asiana Flight 214 in San Francisco. They shut down the ILS that day, plus they shut down the PAPI. Remember those lights? Two red lights, two white lights. I'm on course, I'm on profile. Well, they took that away. And they hit the seawall to, uh, to the approach and run a uh, two-way left in San Francisco. So this was a visual approach. Three people were killed. Pilots do not like visual approaches. We want instrument assisted approaches. And if we do a visual approach, there could be a bit of problems. Okay. You can have whiteout effect. There's the black hole effect. Sometimes you're on an approach into a runway and there's no references to light or depth perception. It can be dangerous out there. So that's why we always like to stick on instruments. And I just flew into LA. Uh, LA, most of American controllers are notorious for this. They'll say, uh, Air Canada, do you got the airport in, uh, in sight? And we're about 25 miles back. And we say, affirmative. Okay, you're clear the visual. So that's alleviating all the responsibility for the approach. And, uh, you know, I don't know if you've ever seen LA, but it's a sea of lights. There's a million lights there, and uh, we have to go visual now, but we actually stay on the ILS. But it's, it, controllers do it all the time. In LaGuardia, they do it all the time. All the major airports in the States, they want to alleviate their responsibility by going and giving you a visual approach. So that's it. Uh, that's the ILS. Uh, low visibility takeoffs. Years ago, I took this picture. Well, I was the cruise pilot. Cruise pilot is the third pilot that sits in the back. He doesn't get into the uh, two pilot seats until about 10,000 feet. So I was a cruise pilot and took this picture. This is uh, New Delhi, which is infamous for fog in the wintertime. Uh, New Delhi is going to be going down in fog a lot lately. Um, and this is runway 28 in New Delhi. And I don't know if you can see it, but here are the runway lights here. There's one, two, three. Remember I said... Each runway light is separated by 200 feet. So the RVR, that, that particular moment was down to 800 feet, but officially they're reporting 600 feet. That's only 600 feet you can see down the runway. And just imagine, this is a fully loaded Airbus 340 going on, just about to go on a 15 hour flight back to Toronto. We are at maximum weight. The temperature is up around 28 degrees Celsius and it makes for some very interesting takeoffs. So this is the a low visibility, real life. This is not simulator. This is a real life departure out of New Delhi. Now, because the, the, the weather's so low, uh, it has to be capped and flown. And we need a whole bunch of requirements to take off in such low visibility. I need high intensity runway lights and I need center line lights. These are the center line lights here. There's my high intensity runway lights. I need center line markings and I need two forward scattered RVR sensors, not less than 600 feet. So those are the kind of qualifications um, I need to take off in low visibility. For being an airline pilot, you almost gotta be a part-time lawyer. You gotta know all your little gotchas, your rules. And we have a lot of checklists and just in case if we uh, forget about uh, all the details. Why do we, uh, Make sure that we have the center line markings and uh, where we are. Years ago, there was a, a, a flight, uh, Singapore Airlines taking off on Taiwan. They taxied to a, onto a parallel runway, but that parallel runway was closed down and it had a lot of machinery. They took off in a typhoon and they crashed into the machinery. So we always have to verify the runway when we get to the, to the uh, onto the runway. And, because it's low visibility, we probably can't come back. So we had to have a takeoff alternate. We have to have a takeoff alternate within an hour on an engine out. So try to do all the math. So if I take off out of Pearson, is Ottawa good enough for me if I lose an engine in low visibility? So that's all the kind of juggling we do, but flight dispatch does all of it, mostly. Yeah. Two quick questions. Uh, so how do you confirm if you're on parallel runways that you're on the, on the correct one? We have to look at this, 
the, the markings. Okay. So this would be uh, two eight left or two eight right if it was parallel runways. Okay. Correct. Yes. Yeah. So that's when you're entering the runway. Yes, and also the localizer. Uh, the localizer would have a different frequency. So we say, okay, I'm on the localizer two eight left. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah. And and the, the takeoff, uh, whether it's low visibility or normal visibility, it is manually cloned. So uh, it's with reference to the runway lights. Absolutely. Great point. There are no such thing as an automatic takeoff. However, the Airbus world is trying to make it such that you can take off automatically. But right now, all runway or all uh, departures, all takeoffs have to be manually flown. Then we engage the autopilot. If I'm flying a Boeing, it's 200 feet above the ground. If uh, it's an Airbus, they allow the autopilot to be engaged 100 feet above the ground on takeoff. So that's the kind of stuff that has to go in the pilot's mind, and back in the mind. And always have a part-time lawyer when you're flying, especially in low visibility. And speaking of that, we're nearing the end. This is me taxiing in Pearson just recently. And a big, beautiful 777 taxis by. So I was pondering. Why was I pondering? Is because that's the biggest airplane Air Canada has, and that's a $30,000 pay raise. So do I want to go on that airplane? And that's what I was looking at. I go, but look at it. I'm looking through the HUD of the Boeing 787, the heads up display, in it, and I go, that airplane, the 777, does not have it, but the Boeing 787 does. And I said, do I want to leave the new technology for this older technology? This airplane now is about 20 years old, the 777. But again, it takes, there's a nice uplift in salary. But I, I'm also telling you about uh, pondering pilots is we're always thinking about what the lawyers would think. Am I legal for takeoff? Am I legal for landing? When you're shooting an approach, cat to approach into Halifax, we need 1,200 RVR for one uh, poor scattered RVR sensor and 600 RVR for the other one. But what happens if the RVR goes down to 1,100? Am I legal? And the answer is no, I have to go around. So that's all the kind of stuff we're thinking about when we're taking off in low visibilities or landing in low visibilities. This is my office, the Boeing 787. That's my email. If you want to uh, send me some questions, you know, um, I like questions. And uh, that, ladies and gentlemen, is my presentation. Great. There, uh, there's questions on the chat, then maybe Omer okay. will monitor that. Okay. Yeah. But questions from the local audience here? Jeremy, just, yeah. a, um, just a suggestion. So sure. um, that is the only mic that's operating. So okay. if you could repeat the question yeah. so the Zoom folks could. Absolutely. Yeah, sure. of course. Uh, there was one up here first. Yeah, let's go with that. So thank you very interested that when you were saying that uh, once you get the aircraft on the ground, that you stop it with brakes rather than uh, the engine. Why is that? Is that because the brakes are cheaper to... Absolutely. You see, but we're tearing the jet engines and uh, it's better to replace the brakes than an engine. So it's wear and tear. Yeah. So for the Zoom folks, the question was just about uh, the choice of brakes versus thrust reversers. Um, another question here from the audience, and then I'll repeat it. Uh, okay. Yeah. There was a case where um, they were, it was supposed to land at Waterloo, which is obvious, and he landed at Darby Air Force Base, the parents from Waterloo at that time. In that case, what happened in Waterloo? Yeah. Boy, the Malton, so you're talking decades ago. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I can't comment on that. Yeah. As yeah. far as which approach was there. Yeah. Oh, as far as the wrong runway or wrong airport? It's happened. Uh, yeah, the landing at Landing at the wrong airport has happened. Uh, I'm not going to say with our airline, but it's I know it's happened. Uh, yeah. And uh, that's years ago, and I don't know the full situation there, though. Oh, good, yeah. good question, though. Yeah. Uh, 
Downs View is closed. Yeah. So the question from the audience for those on Zoom was just a, a comment about uh, someone who landed at the wrong airport and whether that still happens or not. Uh, Omar, are there any questions in the chat? That, uh... No questions in the chat. Just yet. I've invited them to ask you, Chad, but um, Alf Nimmering, who works at the NRC, said that um, uh, I'll speak louder. Hopefully, the mic is picking me up. Yeah. Well, the Zoom folks can see the chat too, but I can repeat the, I can bring it up yeah, here. I'll, and... I'll, I'll yeah. Here. So, um, yeah, Malcolm Emery, who's at the NRC, um, is was saying that uh, they have been doing testing at the NRC for 5G interference, um, and that he will likely offer to present at a future event uh, the, the results of that uh, that testing. Yeah, so, so, see what the worst case is with respect to 5G and interference uh, and so on. Yeah. Excellent. Question from Marcus: uh, How many hours? Um, do new pilots need to get hired by Air Canada? Uh, it used to be around 2,500, but that minimum is coming down. Uh, probably more like 2,000. Uh, jazz is quarter down to 500 hours. In fact, they just announced a jazz, a cadet program. So you can walk in with jazz with zero hours and they'll train you. That is the first cadet program here in Canada. I see another question in the chat and then I'll come back to the audience here. So there was a question from the chat from Sean. Um, do you know the event a few years ago of an aircraft landing on incorrect parallel runway uh, SFO um, was low vis a factor? I don't know. I think I okay. read about this at some yeah. point. But, uh, and, uh, that, that was, was too close, close to home. home. I can't answer okay. that one. Yeah. Perfect. Fair yeah. enough. Too close to home. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, let's go to the audience here. There was one back here maybe and then, uh, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Chad Morris, the sit tangential that broke down about the EBNS the electric start. And I was wondering if that's ground based power or is there still some sort of APU on the aircraft? We do have. And what happens if she was an engine flight? We generally started uh, with uh, the APU. It's giving us the power, but if the APU is not working, we can use uh, ground external power. So the APU is is go-to source number one. Gas turbine yeah. that's running as a generator. Correct. Electricity Correct. Correct. Oh, good, good question. Yes. Uh, another one here. Yeah. Go ahead, Richard. Yeah, you mentioned that the seven has gust mitigation system. Yes. So what can you talk a bit about like, I said, the maximum gust that it can experience? And what sort of? So basically, the airplane's flying along, and there's computers on board. There's sensors, and uh, there's spoilers going up and down the rudder. The uh, ailerons, everything is working in sync to alleviate gusts. Uh, and apparently it's reduced air sickness by a significant amount. I guess like I guess your experience, can you talk a bit about how fumbling from not, not using the system to using the system, do you see like, I don't know, a 50% reduction in the actual acceleration of your experience? Uh, that, those values I don't know. And I just know that uh, passengers love it because the, well, it, exactly. Okay. It's sort of like the, uh, what the, um, and the cru cruise liners, you know, they've got the, the, the big spoilers out there and stuff like that. And they say, you're not going to get seasick. So you're not going to get air sick either flying the Boeing 787. Is it always, always operating? No, it's always operating. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, good, yeah. good question. Uh, one more here, and then we're going to go to chat, and then we'll kind of go back and forth. But go ahead, uh, sir. Yeah. I expect you to say that you can pay $30,000 a year more if you went to the 777. Correct. Uh, why is it this kind of uh, our pay salary is based on the airplane. The bigger the airplane, the more money you make. More seats. Uh, it's more seats. It's also the, the weight of the airplane. I, at Air Canada, most airlines in North America were paid formula pay. So it's predicated on your position. By the way, these are four stripes. That's captain. Three stripes is first officer. A lot of people don't know that. You're not going to see anyone with two stripes or one stripe in North America, but in Canada, it's just four stripes and three stripes. So when you go captain, you make more money. When we fly nighttime, we get paid 12% more than daytime. If I fly overseas, I get paid more. Uh, there's a whole bunch of uh, parameters that make up my salary. So when someone asks me, how much do you make? I really don't know. <laughs> based on, but, and it's also the amount of hours flown. But generally speaking, uh, the small Airbus 220, the C-series airplane, makes a lot less money than the big Boeing 777 pilots. Interesting. Um, so there's a question from the chat here. So Paul Penna asking, if the terrain leading to runway is highly undulating, will the radio altimeter give jumpy readouts? Um, and so will it be confusing? So I guess that I imagine that has to do with the- Yes, there altitude. are some yeah. airports that are conducive to that. And yeah. uh, But generally speaking, uh, 
we would not use a cat two or cat three approach unless all the parameters and all the ducks are lined up. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Good questions. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. Uh, in the middle, in the back there. Yes, we always have the HUD down. It's mandatory for us to have the HUD down all the time, take off and landing. We like to put it up in cruise, but it's against procedures. Yeah. So question for those on Zoom was just about the HUD and when it's used, uh, what phases in flight it's used. Um, other questions from here in the audience? At the back there, yeah. What is the scariest takeoff or landing you've had in terms of how takeoff and landing that stands out that got your adrenaline bumping? Well, I've flown out in the East Coast, and I've flown for four airlines in the East Coast, Eastern Flying Service, Air Atlantic, Air Nova, and Air Canada. And on the East Coast, they have a lot of weather. They have a lot of strong winds. So I had some memorable departures and landings, both in Halifax and St. John's, Newfoundland. Uh, I, not, I can't tell you what the specific day, but uh, we've seen some interesting approaches and landings. Yeah, so the question was the scariest, uh, yeah, scariest scenario. Um, there was a question in the chat. Maybe I'll go to that for a second. How comfortable are you with Autoland uh, technology um, pre uh, presented or presentation? Yeah, or yeah, uh, yeah. We rarely do the Autolands. Uh, I should bring that up. I should mention that uh, last time I Autolanded was two years ago in Frankfurt. So we don't generally Autoland, but. We do have a 100% confidence factor because I practiced it every six to eight months in the simulator. Excellent. I was out for a good one. Yeah. <laughs> well, up here at the front. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, you mentioned that from our limited kind of there and the localizer of wind. So, how would it like a one way street or pin from Bob Street to land on either side of the runway? Because I know we've approached this. Yes. But the Bob Street to land on either side of the runway, like is there a turn there and a localizer on either end of it? No, and that's a problem with Halifax. There's only a transfer, a local glide slope and a localizer at uh, one end of the runway. The other end of the runway only had a localizer. So sometimes you can borrow the localizer to use it on both ends of the runway, but that doesn't always happen either. Okay. Good question. Yep. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, your monograph, no visibility. Yes. Okay, I can I, uh, I can't bring it back. Uh, Oh, what, what would you like to bring back? Just to the, bring back the slide? Yeah. I can bring that back. Which slide are you talking about? Are you referring to the, the book or the... Uh, uh, I think he's, he's asking about your book. Oh, uh, yeah. Maybe after, come on up and we can have a chat up here at the front with the captain afterwards. Yeah. Um, let's go over here and then we'll come back into the middle. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, that was a lot of great questions. Thank yeah, you very much. I thought I was losing you guys a few times. I thought uh, I needed to bring, give you vectors to bring back. It was, yeah, it's really good questions. I'm impressed. September 11th, the September 11th, I was over the Atlantic Ocean from Frankfurt, flying from Frankfurt uh, to Toronto, and we made it as far as Montreal. So we had a duck in there. We stayed at a truck stop for three days. Funny, the night before I had jet lag insomnia. I couldn't sleep. So I turned on the TV. It was CNN. And what were they talking about CNN? This Bin Laden guy. He's up to something. The next day was September 11th. So they knew. Go ahead. Yeah. Ooh, okay, so whenever we, every single landing right now at Air Canada, we, we punch in the data. Uh, and so we have to calculate the landing distance for every runway. It's predicated on weight, the runway, temperature, winds, and all that sort of stuff. So I'm looking at five to 8,000 feet. Absolutely. And uh, so some of the runways, we have to pump up the auto brake system the settings to a setting of four instead of the setting of three to, to uh, alleviate that problem. Yeah, great question. I've got a, uh, sorry, I've got a question on the chat. I just wanted, which I missed, which was a few minutes ago. Uh, Malcolm Emery asks, uh, can Captain Morris talk a bit about ground icing operations mm -hmm. combined with low visibility? For instance, the legalities of holdover times must make life even more complicated. <laughs> it does. And that's, <laughs> yes. And again, remember I talk about having the lawyer in your back pocket? 
Well, icing conditions and that stuff is uh, is huge. Uh, I fly out of Pearson, and Pearson has the biggest de-icing facility in the world, 65 anchors. Uh, again, yeah, so when the vi low visibility is in, is in place and with the icing, it's, 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 it's quite a challenge because sometimes the low visibility will slow up traffic, but the holdover times for the de-icing might not be as long as I need. So I might have to go back to the airport or the de-icing facility and get de-iced. So there's, there's a lot of juggling going on. Fantastic. Yeah. Uh, we'll come back into the room for a question here. Go ahead. What's their plan of doing if they're 800 people short for the pilot? Well, what are they doing for the people? Are they, uh, we're going to be taking, people? we're going to be taking 20% of jazz pilots. So that's going to cause a lot of grief with jazz. By the way, it's just not pilots. If you people want to be flight dispatchers, we're screaming for flight dispatchers. We're looking for flight attendants. We're looking for uh, people working the ramp. Uh, we're short everywhere, but they're short everywhere in the whole air traffic control system. Nav Canada is desperately short. So uh, yeah, we, we're working hard and uh, it, it's a challenge. In fact, I just was to a fleet meeting there two days ago and the chief pilot just scratching his head. They're trying their best, but uh, especially with the simulators and stuff like that, we need, we're screaming for simulators. Take another question here and then I'll go back to the chat. Go ahead. Yeah. Have you ever uh, had a situation, maybe it's not even possible, where your, your sensor, like your instruments and your senses are giving you disparate information? Yeah, so when you learn to fly uh, after private or commercial, um, you go under the hood and you're taught from ab initial training, Right from the beginning, trust your instruments. But it's true. Uh, you could we could be banking the airplane over a cloud deck, and you're going to get disorientated. So you go back in the instruments. In fact, it happens to a lot of pilots when we reposition the simulator. Some pilots actually get sick. They look up and see the uh, the repositioning of the simulator occurring, and they and they throw up. Like I'm thinking, like the open range situation. Yeah. It's a situation where. They were getting information from their instruments. Yes. Telling them one thing. Yeah. And they were reacting based on that. Yeah. We trust our instruments 100%. And we have redundancy. Yeah. That's, that's where I'll go with that one. So a uh, question from the chat here, and I'll read it out for the folks here. So the question is, would you ever feel comfortable having only one pilot in the cockpit <laughs> in the future large commercial aircraft? So that's single the, pilot operations. Single pilot, yes. The, the, they're playing with that one. Yeah, and uh, it's never going to happen for my career, but it might happen twenty years down the road. Yeah, uh, I am sixty-one. Uh, mandatory retirement is sixty-five, so I have theoretically four more years. Every time I go flying now, there's always someone to ask, "Hey, Doug, when are you retiring?" Because they go up a notch. Everything is predicated on seniority. I am senior number two forty-four. There is forty-five hundred pilots at Air Canada. We're going to have fifty-five hundred pilots, and I'm two forty-four. So uh, they all want me to go. <laughs> <laughs> There's actually related to that. I'll just pass on this question from the chat because the question is for staffing for pilots. Are there any realistic expectations of increasing retirement age to 67 or so? And there's talk of that. that correct. Correct. Yeah. They're talking about that in the United States. And if it happens in the United States, it'll happen here in yeah. Canada. But I'll probably retire by then. By then. <laughs> Good question. Um, two, two questions that are back up on the chat uh, from John McNaughton. Um, are there uh, differences uh, between the 787 and 737 MAX avionics? That's the first question. The avionics, generally speaking, it's uh, very modern. The 737 avionics, they even have a heads-up display. However, there's a lot of Jurassic Park going on, the overhead panel and stuff like that. They kept it kind of old for uh, other airlines to uh, adapt to. Okay, thank you. And uh, second question from the chat: uh, How comfortable are you with the Autoland uh, technology? Again, uh, I train it in the simulator. Uh, I'm very comfortable with it. I've flown with some pilots; they don't see it uh, all that often. And again, I'm from the East Coast, so I've seen a lot of low visibility approaches. In fact, the terminology when I was flying back there is when you down send it down to minimums and an ILS. The code was: When did you get the lights? And we'd always say minimums, meaning we cheated. <laughs> those are the those were the good old days. So I, that, that's not with my airline now, but I'm just saying uh, with other airlines I've flown with, <laughs> we might have 
So let's come back in the room. I'm, I'm going to come here first, and then I'll come back. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Yes. Thirty thousand pairs. Yeah. So to go to like twenty seven eight seven. Oh, okay, good. I like that. Now tell my wife that one too, because she likes that pay raise coming too. I <laughs> yes, yes, you would have to whole new course, and generally speaking, a full course is about eighty thousand dollars, and it takes the pilot offline for about three months. You have to go and get pilots only fly one type of airplane. For flight attendants, they can fly any type of airplane. But for a pilot, you have to be certified only on one airplane, and it takes at least three months. And adding on top of something, for example, like for the 787, you fly to Dash 9, you mentioned. Yes. You can fly to Dash 8. Through Correct. The same Correct. Yeah. We have about eight Dash 8s, and the rest, 30 of them are Dash 9s. And again, we have three more coming. Let's go over here, and then I'll come over to Nick after. Go ahead. Is the age limit date for 65 imposed by Air Canada? It's, it's ICAO. Yeah, yeah, it's IKO. Yeah, so the question uh, for those on Zoom was was where who, who's imposing the sixty five uh, yeah. the age limit? So yeah, and that that just changed a few years ago. Uh, I've flown with a lot of pilots, and uh, they retired at age sixty. Yeah, but now it's sixty five, and they're talking about maybe running it to sixty seven. A lot of pilots, a lot of people are asking me, "Will you see a um, a pilotless flight deck?" But I'll ask you this question: Would you like to hear me say? Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Captain Doug Morris speaking. I'll be working from home today. <laughs> uh, Nick, go ahead. People talked earlier about the uh, uh, flying with people who didn't trust the pilots. Yeah, yeah. The a flight instructor, how would you go about trying to train them to trust the pilots? Would you try to get them to fail in the simulator? And then that's what they'll do. Yeah, uh, I don't teach in the simulator. I just teach on the real line, uh, on on line. So what I would do to show, give confidence to the captain, I would get him to shoot an approach. We call it shoot an approach or do a cat auto land on a, a runway that has good visibility. So he will see how the airplane comes in, flares. It's really neat to watch an airliner flare by itself. And then the thrust levers go back to idle and the auto brakes kick in and then it'll come right to a stop. And again, you have to disengage the autopilot because the flight's over and to take it off the runway. So that is the kind of neat stuff you'll see on the real, the real airplane. Uh, Dave, did you have a question back there? Oh, no, go ahead. Yeah, up here. Hi, um, I've noticed an increase in, or at least I'm seeing the events that have to do with heavy snow and runway contamination. Um, Pop up more often, and now for two years we've had an exemption on operations below quarter mile visibility uh, at airports that have a liquid water flow system in place. Uh, in general, what is your experience with heavy snow operations, and how do you deal with it? Okay, we do. And again, good point that there are systems, devices at most airports here in Canada uh, that tell us uh, what the precipitation is, the visibility, and our holdover times. So that's what we stick to. However, if the precipitation is changing, the captain can challenge the precipitation, but he can't challenge the intensity. So that's the kind of stuff that's going on again. Part time lawyer. I got to bring out the lawyer and say, is this legal? Yeah. So and I've had that in, in Pearson. It was happening so bad, it was heavy snows, and the system said, you can't take off. And uh, so we, but we learned that we could have, but, but we had to challenge it. So I'm going to go back to the chat for a second. So there's a, a comment and then a question. So the comment is, is from Malcolm. Most famous East Coast airline for low vis landings was Down East International, fictional creation of a former Air Canada captain and That's smiley, right. yeah. smiley face. So I, I'm assuming there's an, a bit of an yeah. inside joke there. That, yeah. uh, I don't know if you want to say anything about that. Or no, he wrote uh, for yeah. an aviation magazine. Yeah. He did a great job. And yeah. All us pilots love uh, yeah. his articles and yeah. Uh, we wish they were back. Yeah, excellent. And then the question is, um, so this is a qu another question from the chat. What are the advantages, if any, of getting a degree in engineering before becoming a pilot uh, at Air Canada or, or in general? At uh, one that's time, applicable to a few of the students here. For at sure. one time, Air Canada wanted to hire nothing but engineers, but we only had a class of four. <laughs> so that didn't work out too well. On that note, I would like to bring up that you do not have to have a degree to be an airline pilot here in Canada. However, in the United States, you need a degree for now. But because they're so desperately short there, they're bringing away or knocking that requirement down. So, I, um, 
I've got a question maybe related to that, and then we'll go back to the audience. So um, I know a lot of, traditionally, there was a lot of pilots that came from the military. Yes. Uh, from military aviation. Are you still seeing that, or is there some challenges there? I know the military itself is struggling to recruit. So is there a little bit of competition, or is that uh, uh, a challenge? Great question. And you know what? That question's asked in this book, or answered in this book. <laughs> the self are turning off. Yeah. No, no, there are three ways of becoming a pilot. You pay at flying clubs. You take go to flight uh, colleges or universities like Seneca, or the military. However, the military you got a sixty percent chance of flying a helicopter, and not many people are going to the military here in Canada. In the states, it's huge because you got the Navy, you got your Air Force, you got the Army. All of them teach pilots how to fly. But in Canada, the military is probably the least traveled or use, least used uh, way Oops. of okay. becoming a yeah. pilot now. Yeah. Um, yeah, here we'll come into the, and then I'll go back to the chat. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's got a lot of clunky flap levers and stuff like that. Oh, bulky seats and stuff. Yeah, they could have spruced it up a lot better to uh, compare to Airbus. Yeah. But they have a beautiful HUD display. Yeah. yeah. I guess is there anything like from a performance standpoint you don't like it? performance wise i love it it's amazing it's amazing it gets up the altitude yeah. and that's the thing about the triple seven it's so big and so heavy it has to sit down around thirty thousand to thirty two thousand feet for 10 hours to be able to be light enough to get up at high altitude i can just get up to forty thousand. look at that triple seven down there saying <laughs> he's in the bumps in the smooth air i'm having a cough and he's bouncing around any other aircraft that fly uh, only biz jets, okay. only biz jets. They get higher too. They get up to around forty five thousand. We're looking up there in a biz jet and go, wow! I'm at forty one thousand. He's up there forty five, yeah. but he can scoot. Um, question from the chat, and then I'll come to back to the audience. So, the question in the chat is: I've heard that uh, one problem with practicing auto lands is each pilot needs to log a certain number of actual landings to remain current, but that's hard on long haul routes because I guess you don't have as many opportunities, yeah. right? So, it's the restriction is not the auto land; it's the takeoff and landings. And we need three takeoff and landings every three months. And you say, "Oh, geez, he should be able to do that." Well, uh, it's it's more difficult than you think. For a first officer, sometimes they'll fly as the fourth pilot, so they don't touch the uh, flight controls. Uh, so, yeah, it could be uh, several months before they actually take off and land. Mm -hmm. So if they run out, they, if their takeoff and landings expired, they have to go back in the simulator. Wow. Back in the simulator and get recertified. Uh, but back for today, or this this month, I'm doing 17 takeoff and landings, so, so no issue there. I'm okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm on. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, what's the shortest runway we offer uh, Edinburgh's kind of short. They only have one, one runway in Scotland too, Edinburgh. Austin. Yeah, it's kind of short, but uh, generally speaking, we are flying the bigger airports and they all have long runways. Yeah, well, they're quite, yeah, go ahead. Um, in terms of the aviation weather, what is the current, in your opinion, biggest threat that you address? Pilots don't know enough about weather. Uh, it's actually kind of scary. I've been teaching it for years and uh, you can write your test now, online cheating, uh, so they don't really know the weather. And I fly with a lot of pilots and I, uh, you know, again, I'm, I'm preaching here now because I've got a couple of weather books, but yeah, uh, weather is, is like voodoo. Uh, a lot of people talk about it, but they don't want to really admit to the fact that the, they don't know much about it. Yeah, it, it's, I, I think it's a, a concern here in Canada. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, they're not totally flat. Some of them, like the Pearson 33 right, it's got a good hump on it. Uh, you go fly into Atlanta, the busiest airport in the planet, there's dips in the runway. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, the slope. That's right. You can only have two degrees slope for a runway, so that's all uh, factored in when we type do our what data, weight, uh, altitude, temperature uh, calculations. Yeah, Jeff. Yeah, Can you say something about uh, the, the kind of evolving uh, consideration for flight in and around volcanic ash? Okay, we do have a checklist for volcanic ash. Um, yeah, great point. I, when I did my master's at Purdue, I wrote a paper uh, based on the uh, 
the volcano that blew in Iceland. And it was a, it was a disaster how European airspace, uh, air traffic control treated it. Uh, it shouldn't have been that way, but now they have different uh, requirements. Uh, it's a lot more, um, not lenient, but more realistic about flying around volcanic ash. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, we're in the process of starting a library of aviation airspace sector books in the Intentional Airspace Society. And on top of that textbook there, do you have any recommendations for us a, a book you would want aerospace engineers designing the planes of the future to read? Um, from the ground up, it's a basic book. Uh, you yeah, probably know. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. That one, yeah, yeah. yeah. Great question. Um, other questions? So, yeah, so here's a. Uh, um, question from the chat or comment. So another concern is wake turbulence encounters and crews that seem to be a limiting factor to airspace capacity on the best routes. Uh, can Captain uh, Morris talk about that hazard a bit? Uh, yes. So wake turbulence, that's basically bumps from another airplane. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, there's six different types of turbulence, all caused naturally by Mother Nature. However, there's a seventh type of turbulence called wake turbulence, and it comes from the, the wingtips of another airplane. It's like uh, in the water, a boat, you know, causing ripples to another boat. So what we do is we do have procedures. If I fly to London Heathrow tonight, I will offset my track by one or two miles to alleviate wake turbulence. So that's one way we do it. Air traffic control will keep us uh, separated. Um, they'll tell us, hey, you've got a big heavy airplane cross in your path there. Stay tuned. You might get some ripples. Yeah, so there's another question in the chat, a direct message to me here. So do you need to fly around pyro CBs or can you fly through? I don't pyro CB. I don't wow. <laughs> okay. Yeah. They're digging deep. That's a that's a thunderstorm created by a fire. Ah. In fact, I've got some good pictures out of San Francisco of pyro cumonimbus. Uh well, no, we would never fly. Uh, yeah. <laughs> we'd, we'd always fly around. They don't get as high as a yeah. regular thunderstorm, but they, they, they all, I was times. impressed by it. They got up to about 25, 30,000 feet. Um, Pyroclinium nimbus. Wow. Yeah. Jeff, go ahead. <laughs> Are there kind of fixed criteria for you to decide when you're going to turn the um, seatbelt sign on the airplane or just keep passengers moving around? And keep them oh, great question. A lot of people think the seatbelt sign is done by some magical instrument. It's done by the captain or the first officer. So it's funny, I go back and use the washroom and then it gets a bit bumpy and the seatbelt sign goes on. The flight says, oh, the captain just put on the seatbelt sign. How did I do that? I was in the washroom. <laughs> but it's totally subjective. Yeah. And that's and I tell the guys, I say, why are we getting bumps? I say, figure out why we're getting bumps. Then put the seatbelt. So I've flown with some pilots. They're flying like this. The seatbelt sign is up here. And they fly like this, just waiting for a little first little ripple and then they put it on. You know, that just it's, it's, it serves no purpose doing that, but yeah, it's totally subjective. Uh, it's either done by the captain or the first officer. Any other questions here? Um, yeah, go ahead uh, there. Yeah, oh, yeah. Um, in fact, the Boeing 787 has HMU health monitoring unit type stuff. So I was in Heathrow just about a year ago. And we had a fuel pump issue. So our maintenance in Montreal went into the system and told us what to do to fix that fuel pump. In fact, with from their laptop in Montreal, they can tell me how many times this toilet's flushed. So that's the kind of stuff, technology that's out there. Lots of data. Lots of data. Yeah. Tons of data. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, is there a push for the airlines like closer to um Okay, yes. So you're talking about icy, ice crystal icing. And we still have the same rule of thumb, stay 20 nautical miles away from a thunderstorm. We can fly over some thunderstorms at their low base. And yes, there is a risk of icy. And the Boeing 787 jet engines, they were succumbing to ice crystal icing but they've readjusted something in the engine. I can't be specific about it, but now we don't have icy uh, situations with the Boeing 787. Uh, I don't know, I can't answer for the other types of airplanes. So is there a trend 
among airlines to fly the most uh, cheapest route. Oh, absolutely. Not go around. Oh, hundred uh, percent. Every route uh, is can be different from the day before. And it's all done by flight dispatch. It's done by Lido, Lufthansa integrated dispatch operation out of uh, uh, Germany. We use the system and it, it calculates the cheapest route, the most expeditious route and the safest route every time. So I've got maybe we're, we're gonna be wrapping up in a minute but I've got one a question as well, just related to weather. Um, have you so we've heard that there's an increase in turbulence due to climate change? You know, the atmosphere, more energy, more heat, it's being more. Is that something you've observed? And you know, anecdotally, so people, is it people ask me that, and they also ask me, are thunderstorms getting bigger? Yeah, and I can't see, I can't see the difference. Yeah, in fact, I think my flights are smoother. Maybe it's because I'm get, getting to be a better pilot. <laughs> <laughs> no, in fact, in order to get weather, you need two things you need the unequal heating of the sun. And you need the circulate or the rotation of the Earth. What they're saying is, if due to climate heating, your North Pole is not as cold, and your equator is still pretty warm. So therefore, you don't have a temperature difference uh, that's driving the jet streams. So they're saying that jet streams are decreasing. But I've been in some very strong jet streams lately, or 200 knots uh, over the Pacific Ocean. So they're still there. Still there. Still yeah. there. But. Excellent. So we got one, maybe we'll take one more in the audience here and then we're just after 7.30. So we'll be wrapping up in a sec. Go ahead. Yeah. I was just wondering, do you have any thoughts on the development of supersonic airliners? And does Air Canada have any plans to purchase any uh, like United Airlines? Yeah. Yeah. I don't, I've never heard of that. Well, we just bought 20 electric airplanes. Yeah. So that's a start. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, supersonic, no, I've never heard anything down the pipe for that. But that would be kind of cool. Yeah, the boom, I think Boom Supersonic is yeah, the one of the, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so I, I do see two questions from the chat and maybe we'll close on these. Um, what role do thin ice clouds have on severe weather or severe storms in Canada or up north? Um, and then a comment, a question about any comments on flying steep approaches. So one question about weather, the, okay. the thin ice clouds and then steep approaches, and we'll close well, on those two. If thin ice, yeah. if it's thin, uh, uh, thin clouds, then yeah. the, the liquid water content is just not there. So yeah. we're not going to get accumulation of ice and thin clouds. see an issue with those. Yeah. yeah. And then the other question is uh, steep approaches. Steep so, approaches. Yeah. Basically, all our uh, ILS approaches are three degrees. Some of them might be 3.2, <laughs> but that is it. We do have a procedure sometimes where we can't capture the glide slope. And that's not nice for an airliner because an airliner can't go down and slow down at the same time. So to capture a glide slope sometimes, it's a bit of a challenge, but uh, we have a procedure for that. Excellent. Um, so I think with that, we're, we're going to close things. So another round of applause for uh, So thank you to the folks on Zoom. Um, I'm going to uh, uh, end the meeting on Zoom. So thank you, everybody, for your questions and attention tonight on Zoom. And thank you to all the folks here in the audience. Um, thank you to Captain Morris for uh, an excellent oh, talk and yeah, lots of great questions. That was really, really great to see. Really appreciate it. Um, yeah, I don't know, Omar and Jeff, if you'd like to say a few words, go ahead uh, to close things out. Yeah. Okay, well, on everybody's behalf, thank you, Jeremy. Thank you, Captain Doug, for this. Uh, very interesting to hear uh, about what Cassie is really trying to invigorate and, and to, to extend the idea of the art and science and engineering of aerospace and, and the business side of it, too. And I think your talk was was very enlightening okay, thank all you. of the audience thank you, thank you. And, and well attuned to kind of student interests and people in the working profession. So you. you've, I think you found it a, a really interesting balance to be able to talk to a very diverse group at that. Great. Thanks for your- Thank you. For your time. Yeah. Yeah, and um, thank you, Jeremy, for your moderation there. Uh, yeah, well done. done. Yeah, yeah. Yes, uh, all those uh, years at the podium in the classroom. Yeah. 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 Comes in handy, for sure. Yeah. I, I have so much to say, and it's like, I know everyone, you know, probably wants to get going, but uh, yeah, further, um, yeah, to Jeff's, um, uh, thank you very, thank you so much, you. Uh, Captain Morris. A uh, lot of interest, uh, both from, you know, the in-person attendees and, and the Zoom audience with their questions, so fantastic. 
Um, on a um, on a personal note, so I I, I met uh, uh, Captain Morris uh, about seven years ago. I reached out to him. Uh, he was actually a consultant for my company on the uh, A320 uh, landing distance calculator app, which was actually very popular, very successful. And we also talked about developing an app for clear air turbulence, uh, but you know that never came to pass, uh, unfortunately. But uh, yeah, so thank you so much. And on behalf of Cassie Auto Branch, uh, here's a book uh, that I love. It's uh, the Wright Brothers biography. And they were actually meteorologists as well. They chose to go to Kitty Hawk uh, because they checked the weather okay. uh, data, historical okay. weather I didn't data. Know that. And uh, they said, let's go there because the winds are steady and strong okay. wow. in the summertime. Great. So please enjoy. And, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. That was good. Great. Thanks, everyone online. We're signing off now from uh, from here at uh, Carleton, and have a good night, everybody. Yeah, thanks, everyone. Great. Thanks.